presence with thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise and give him praise come to his presence with thanksgiving in your heart your voice is raised your voice is raised give glory Thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise and give him praise. Come to his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voice is raised, your voice is raised.
come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house, gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship Christ the and welcome to our online worship service here at Eastside Church. We hope that you will come and join us very soon and be in the room with us as we celebrate the greatness of Christ. In a moment, we continue the series entitled Great Chapters of the Bible, continuing a, a series within that series on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, talking about the love of God and love itself in this month of February where our culture emphasizes surrounding Valentine's Day, love itself. Now, before we get into the message, I, I want to do again today what we've been doing the last few Sundays in February, and that is remembering African-American black Christian heroes, wonderful men and women of faith that have made a difference as in our nation we are remembering uh, our African-American community with Black History Month, Today I want to introduce you, and you'll see some pictures of him, to the late Reverend Tom Skinner. Tom lived from 1942 to 1994, 
and he is a life that should be celebrated. He was a former street gang member who was born in Harlem, New York, and God radically transformed his life and protected him, especially in those early days, because of Christ when he came out of the gang, something that usually results in dire consequences. As Skinner grew spiritually, he became a powerful evangelist who shared the gospel of Jesus Christ for over 30 years in 70 different countries. He was also the chaplain for the Washington football team of the NFL. He also was a, a motivator and speaker to other sports teams. Before he died, he and his team established a high technology learning center which serves the inner city. They also established before his death the Skinner Leadership Institute, which provides networking, bridge building, and leadership development to this day. Tony Evans describes uh, Tom uh, Skinner as a, as a bridge builder, a true bridge builder, seeking reconciliation and breaking down walls of age, economic status, race, and religion. Skinner emphasized social justice and racial reconciliation. But he did this. He always presented the gospel when accentuating the kingdom of God. He did not believe that racial reconciliation could truly happen unless the gospel of Jesus Christ was in the mix. He had the unique ability to communicate with every age and cultural group, something that Tony Evans, a pastor in Dallas, Texas, and head of Urban Alternative, has said that, that uh, Skinner helped him develop. Uh, Evans writes, I could not comprehend why the church should be just, just be spiritual while neglecting the social or why, or, or why social activism should be done as it was so often done absent of sound theology integrated in and through the local church as well. Evans said that Skinner helped me formulate a balanced view of the gospel. So I hope that today that you'll remember this amazing brother in Christ who went to heaven now almost 30 years ago, Tom Skinner. He should be celebrated for what he has accomplished. And we continue to thank God for brothers and sisters in Christ of African-American heritage here with Black History Month here at Eastside and across our land. Let's have a word of prayer and we shall get into the word of God with 1 Corinthians 13. Father, today, as those who are watching, listening, they have needs. And we pray that as we examine your word today, that we would see those needs met. Thank you for this universal, beautiful principle, reality called love. And I pray today that we would be faithful as we listen, that I be faithful as I teach about the importance of your love for us and how we need to demonstrate that love for others. Now help us, we pray, as we study your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said a moment ago, we are in the midst of a bigger series called Great Chapters of the Bible. And we are with a series within this series on love in February. And today we want to go, as we have the last few weeks, and will for the remainder of this month, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, today we want to look at the qualities of love, part two. We looked at some qualities last week, some more qualities this week. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, picking up at verse 5, speaking of love, here's what the Apostle Paul writes. It, meaning love, does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And then in verse 7, he says, It, that is love, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. Now, these words are a continuation of what we started some two weeks ago when we began to look at the first verses of 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, where in the love chapter, before Paul ever talks about what love is, as we're seeing this week and last, he talks about what love isn't. 
He has told us, though, as we begin this chapter, that when it comes to love, it's the best thing in the world. There's nothing higher, greater, and nobler than love, and God is love. He says basically that love is the best, meaning it's, it's, the, it's the blue ribbon. The Olympics are going on now. It's, love is, the, love is the, the gold medal. Love is the perfect score on the SAT test. Love is the highest. It is the best. It is the greatest. In fact, he, he finishes the chapter saying, faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these three is love. As he is breaking it down, he, he says, I need you to understand this. Love, love, isn't what I, love isn't what I say. I can have great words to say. I can be articulate in many languages and in spiritual languages. But what I say, if it isn't mixed in with love, it equals nothing. It equals zero. Love is not only what I say, not what I say, but it's, it's not what I have. Paul says in, in the second verse of this chapter, even though I, I have, if you will, great ability, great faith that I could speak and move mountains with what spiritual gifts I have, if I don't have in that mix of what I have, love, it's nothing. And then he goes on and he says, love is not what I do. I can take care of the poor. I can offer my body as, a, as a, a martyr, my body to be burned. But if I do those physical acts without love, it profits me and everyone else with zero or nothing. So Paul, Paul begins here with a list of qualities of love. The first thing he says here is love is patient. Love is patient. Then next he says love is kind. The third thing he says in verse 3, when defining, or verse 4, in defining love, he says basically love is not jealous. There's no jealousy streak in love. There's no envy in love. The fourth thing he lists as a quality is he says love doesn't brag. It isn't puffed up. It's not egotistical. It's not self-centered. It's not making yourself the center of a parade. And then number five, the fifth quality, he says love is not arrogant. It's not filled with um, ego. It's not filled with pride. Love is not arrogant. Now, as we move into the verses that we're studying today, beginning at verse 5, he moves into more, at least eight more qualities of love. We want to take a look at them this morning. The first quality that's mentioned here in verse 5 is he says, love does not dishonor others. Love does not dishonor others. In other words, it doesn't behave unbecomingly or unseemingly. It does not act weird. It doesn't act strange. It doesn't act odd or peculiar. Paul is saying here that love is polite. Love is, is, is gracious. Love is not Rude. When you see someone acting rude to you, someone who won't speak to you, someone who refuses to acknowledge you, that's not love. Love is not rude. Love is not acting strange. Love acts graciously and not gracelessly. Here is a real danger for Christians if we are ever rude. We need, to understand, we need to understand that when we are rude as Christ followers, we can turn away people from the gospel of Jesus Christ before they've ever had a chance to hear it. The way we conduct ourselves really does matter. And like me, I think you're convicted of that fact. He says love does not dishonor others. It's, it's gracious. It's kind. It's not cutting people off or acting like they don't exist or walking by without saying something. Or you, some, you say hello to someone and they won't say hello back intentionally. Come on. That's not love. The second thing he says here in our lesson today in verse 5 is love does not seek her own or its own. Love does not seek its own. Uh, I was told about a, a small English village where there is an inscription on a gravestone in a cemetery. And the inscription reads, Here lies a miser who lived for himself and cared for nothing but gathering wealth. Now where he is or how he fares, 
nobody knows and nobody cares. That's the reputation of a person who, who just seeks themselves first. What Paul says here is that love does not seek its own. That's saying that love isn't selfish. The very word agape for love here, love for agape in Greek, is it's others-focused. It's not self-focused. And as in all things, the Lord Jesus is the great illustrator or model of this. It says that the Lord Jesus came not to, not to serve, not, not to have himself be served, but to serve others. The Lord Jesus came and, and he, he, he was all about others. Where Paul is writing here, he's saying, look, love does not seek its own. Love isn't me first. Love is about putting others first. Look at another quality here, and you'll see it in verse 5. Paul writes, he says, love is not provoked, easily provoked. Another word might be here, angered. Love is not easily angered. Love doesn't have a bad, ugly temper. I hope you've heard that. Love doesn't have a mean, ugly temper. It doesn't have these outbursts of anger. I believe one of the most uncomfortable times in my life is when I have witnessed someone who is being filled with rage and anger and taking it out on someone else. I've seen it on a few occasions. It is one of the most uncomfortable things in the world that you can experience when you see someone acting out rage and seeing someone being a target of that rage. I, I can remember um, a number of years ago with Sharon, and we were sitting in a restaurant and in a booth, and in a booth across from us, there was a older man, a husband it appeared, who was sitting there with his wife, and when the waitress brought the food to the table, he became verbally irate, directing all of this anger at his wife because his eggs had not been cooked the way he had requested they be cooked. And he made this enormous scene. It was incredible verbal rage to his wife as I and Sharon and that waitress and others in that restaurant watched. It was an enormously uncomfortable feeling. That's a 180 from love. Paul says love is not easily angered, flying off the handle over eggs not cooked to one specification. Come on. Love doesn't fly off the handle. Love doesn't have a bad temper. And then notice next, would you please there, also in verse 5, love doesn't keep records of wrongs. Love doesn't keep records of wrongs that are suffered in your life. If you look at the word record there, by the way, this is about keeping score, keeping a, a list of, of things, holding it against somebody. That's not love. If you look at the word there where, where he, he says it keeps no record of wrongs in verse 5, that is the word in Greek logizomai. It's where we get our word logical or illogical. It was a word used in the, in, in the first century Greek world to describe accounting, where you have a set of numbers here and a set of numbers here, and it would be logizomai, it would be logical that the two numbers should add up. If the numbers don't add up, it's illogical. What Paul is saying here is that it's just illogical in your Christian life, if you want to have love, to keep a laundry list of things that people or persons or an individual has done to you. It's keeping up. It's keeping score. That's not love. Love doesn't keep record of rights and wrongs, especially wrongs. If love kept a record of wrongs, my wife Sharon would have left me a long time ago, but she loves me. And with that love comes forgiveness. I uh, read this week from Mayo Clinic 
an article and in it was a question. What are the benefits of forgiving someone? Again, this is a secular, respected Mayo Clinic article. The article says, letting go of grudges and bitterness can make way for improved health and peace of mind. Forgiveness can lead to healthier relationships, improved mental health, less anxiety, stress, and hostility, lower blood pressure, fewer symptoms of depression, a stronger immune system, improved heart health, and improved self-esteem. Emotional health comes when you love people. And if you are that person, whether you, it was caught or taught, whether it was your environment or it's just something that's innate within you, that you have a hard time letting go and forgiving people and you're just keeping a, a, a list of wrongs in your heart and your mind, that is so opposite of the love that Paul talks about is available and should be lived out in every follower of Jesus. If you've got in your life resentment for, toward a person, you've got to let that go. If you are someone who you, you just have a hard time forgiving, listen, listen, you've got to let that go. The Lord Jesus forgave you. Think of your list of wrongs. I think of my list of wrongs. God forgave us. God has the ability to forgive us. Can we not who have received that grace in our lives, turn around and be able to forgive others. Sometimes you have to just let go. And if you don't let go, it's going to create all kinds of additional spiritual, emotional, and physical health problems in your life. Love doesn't keep records of wrong. It doesn't keep score. And then let's go next to the next verse there where he says that love protects, love protects. It, 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 it bears, if you will, the weight like a load-bearing wall bears the weight of a roof or a house. Love has this ability, if you will, to, 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 to protect you, to keep the roof from falling in. It can be like an umbrella that when it's raining all around, it can keep you dry. Love protects us. And what love will do is love will help us carry some very heavy loads in our lives. Love gives us the ability to, to, to handle some hard stress, some weighty issues that come into our lives. Love protects. And then another thing that happens with love is love believes. Love believes. It, it, it trusts. It gives you the ability to, to trust people. Love does that. A long time ago, I made a decision in my life that I would trust people. I determined that I didn't want to live my life just looking always, you know, over my corner for somebody, over my shoulder rather, someone that's going to come after me and, and hurt me or say something about me and uh, bring me harm. Um, I just didn't want to live my life that way. I, I determined that I would trust people. Now, when you make that decision, there are consequences to that. When you, when you trust people, most of the time, you're going to have a tremendous, tremendous environment in your life. It's freeing. But if you're living your life where you are just never trusting, you're insecure, you believe that someone's always out to get you, you're not living a life of love because love believes in the best in people. And because love protects by me believing in the best in people and trusting people, yeah, there are times that you get used. There are times you get lied to. There are times you even get betrayed. I mean, you can be great to people and empower them and love them. I've seen this in my life, and they, they turn around and betray you, and it hurts. But I'd much rather live my life believing in people knowing that God is protecting me in the bigger scheme of all this, then living my life just constantly questioning whether I can trust that person. I, I, I don't know how you, I, I know people that live their lives that way. They, they, they are so massively insecure. They can't trust anybody. I mean, how broken down is that? And then there's a lot of self-fulfilling prophecy that takes place because you don't trust people, you begin to, 
an imagination about them, and then something happens, and it just fits your narrative, and eventually the relationship breaks off, and you say, well, I knew I should have never trusted him, and I was right. Totally wrong approach. What an insecure approach. What he says here is he says, love believes. The same love that trusts is the same love that also protects. And then next, love hopes. You see it there, love hopes. Hopes all things. There's, there's great optimism in love. Great optimism in love. Hope, hope is the belief. I, do, I like to define hope as the belief that God has the power to change things. Hope is the belief that God has the power to change people. Hope is the belief that God has the power to change circumstances. Love hopes all things. There's great optimism in love. Tremendous truth. And then one more. Love endures. Love endures. And, and that's where just love, just love just keeps on going till the end. It just keeps on going till the end. Love endures. It, it perseveres. And with every test that comes in your life, it should make your love stronger. And the love that you have will get you through the tough time. Love never fails, Paul says in the next verse, where we're basically finding the fact is that you can't beat love. It's the most supreme and wonderful thing. It is an amazing, amazing thing, love. No, make, make no mistake about it. The older you get, the more you understand that your love will be tested. Sometimes your love is tested in, in marriage, and then sometimes your, your love is tested in parenting or grandparenting. Sometimes your love is tested in, 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 in your walk with God and your, your daily faith. Sometimes your love is tested on the job or on the field of play. Sometimes your love is tested in business. Your love is tested. And maybe I'm talking to someone right now. Your love is being tested right now. It's very, very difficult. One writer I read this week in preparation stated this, most of us will never, never have a trial like Jesus faced, but there will be situations in our lives where our love will be tested. And how will we respond? Will we throw in the towel? Will we walk away? Will we be content to just let it be, never working toward making things better? Will we be, be, be looking, to, uh, looking past the annoyances that are coming in our lives or will we be indifferent to people who come our way? If we're loving the way that God wants us to love, we will love because love endures all things. And whatever thing you're facing, whatever issue is in front of you, love has the power to endure. It will take you till the end. Now, let's recap. There are about 13 of these that Paul talks about from verses 4 till 7. Look at this. Paul says these qualities of love are out there and should be applied. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love is not arrogant. Love does not dishonor others. Love does not seek its own. Love is not easily angered. Love doesn't keep records of wrongs. Love protects. Love believes. Love hopes. Finally, love endures. Now, what we will do next week, as you see at that list, is we're going to talk about the endurance of love because Paul is going to say in the next section Love never fails, and love lives on forever. It's the greatest thing. Now, look at that list and those qualities, and, and, and basically what, what Paul communicates to us under inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, and all of those qualities have lasting power. They have eternal capacity, and all of those elements, all of those qualities of love can be lived out in us as individuals and lived out in us as a church. So next week, we're going to look at the permanence of love. Now, let me do one thing before we're done and just speak to us as a church family, as the body of Christ here at Eastside. As I was looking at this and I was wondering, 
and, and, and thinking through all of this as to how do we wrap this up as we are looking at these 13 qualities of love, how does this apply to a church like us where we are coming out of the COVID situation with so much polarization in our country and in our world and with tensions high, with inflation going up? How, how, does, this, how does all of the qualities of love live out in us? Well, with that list of 13 that you see in mind, I, I'm drawn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Galatians 5, 22, where Paul is speaking to another church, the church at Galatia. And what he is saying here to them is that there is a fruit or a cluster, like a grouping of grapes. There, there's a fruit of the Spirit with elements that need to be in our lives as we live the Christian life. In other words, this list of, 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 of clusters make up the fruit of the Spirit, and it is in direct connection with what Paul lists as the qualities of love. For he says here in verse 22 of Galatians 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, fruitfulness, gentleness, and, and self-control. Against these things, there, there is no law. Look at that list there. You look at these, and what you find here, you read this carefully, and you lay it on top of 1 Corinthians 13, or you lay 1 Corinthians 13 on top of it, and it would be transparent so you could see from one page through to the next you see that all the characteristics, the 13 characteristics of love, show up in these clusters, this cluster of the fruit of the Spirit, these, these gifts, these fruits of the Spirit. So then I ask the question to us as a church, what does love accomplish or do in our community at Eastside, what, 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 what happens when we become a church that is exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit and the characteristics of our qualities of love? And what love will do in our church, it has in the past, it is now, and it will do in the future, if we'll just get more serious and more intense and focused about it, more intentional about it. What love will do in our church, it will edify it will build up the body of Christ. And what the love of 1 Corinthians 13, those qualities will do, is they will release the power of the Holy Spirit into lives, into our communities, into neighborhoods, and to people that we're talking to and touching every day. And it'll be something, if we're consistent, it will be something that people will sense when they walk on our campus. That'll be true in our school. And it'll be true when we go away from here on mission opportunities to live out Christ and his love in communities in our nation or all over the world. That's an amazing thing. If we will be filled with the Spirit, we'll exhibit the qualities of love. If we will pursue the qualities of love, we will reflect the Holy Spirit and his power in our lives. And that power is a power we don't have. And it's the way we can build our work, our church, with love in the midst of a world where there is chaos and arguing and polarization and this and that and are you this or you're on that side, that side. Love works through all of those things, those 13 qualities. It works through all of those things. And what does it do? It allows the love of God, the love of Christ, to be felt. And people want to be a part of that. And people are drawn to a people who love. They are drawn to a community who loves. And that love will see us into a very bright future. I hope you really give that some thought. Because it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not just about us. It's about him and living out his love to a world, to a community, to a neighborhood who desperately needs to know that love in their lives. And it can be demonstrated through us. 
I appreciate you listening today. God bless you. We'll talk to you soon.